I'd like to mention just very briefly uh, along the line of Dr. Bob Cathcart, as we all know, his website, orthomed.com, is an absolute treasure chest of information. And I don't know enough about the internet, but now that unfortunately this uh, American treasure has passed away, I don't know whether that website, whether that has to be paid for on a monthly or annual basis, uh, but that uh, should be of a concern and something we should not lose. Now maybe Dr. Levy in Colorado Springs might want to pick it up, maybe this organization might want to pick it up, but there's, there is so much, there is so much in that website. What's the URL again, please? I beg your pardon? What's the URL again? Orthomed. Orthomed.com. O-R-T-H-O-M-E-D.com. That's Dr. Bob Cathcart. Now I don't know uh, I don't know what happens to a website when someone passes away. I don't think it continues. It stays. It does stay? They, they some of them stay for years. Okay, all right. Well, I just want to, I want to bring it up. Now, this evening, this evening, uh, I'm going to introduce a gentleman that is an iconoclast, along with a lot of the other people that we have here, uh, like Dr. Phil Miller, Dr. Uh, Krije was born in Poland. His parents moved to Israel and uh, after seven or eight years moved to Manitoba, Canada. He graduated from school, very interesting. He went to the University of Manitoba and became a dentist. Now, he graduated from the university, he graduated from college at 16 years old finished his medical school by the time he was 20, but unfortunately you can't practice until you're 21 years old, okay? So it's kind of interesting that he finally started practicing medicine, uh, dental work after he was 21 years old and practiced for a year and didn't find it quite the challenge that he was hoping that it would be. At that point he went to medical school, graduated from medical school, and then, uh, then started practicing, came to Stanford, and uh, had his, doc his graduate work in plastic surgery. He then moved back to Israel, where he practiced medicine, then went to Switzerland and France for additional work in plastic surgery, came back to the United States, and became the head doctor in a hospital he set a 41-bed hospital in Los Angeles in Watts, and uh, an area that I know very well as an ex-foundry foreman in Watts. Now, this man is extremely interesting. He's like most of the people that we bring here, they're different. And they're different is because they're not, they do not enjoy restrictive thought patterns. Most of the people in life, most of the people in life they're here, and any time you move outside of the line, especially in the field of medicine, as we all know, these people are usually criticized, challenged, and all of the things that takes place when a man steps outside of the norm. We understand it because we listen to them all the time. So as a result, I think tonight we're going to hear from a man that's very interesting. He's, he's written two magnificent books. He's writing another book right now, and I was really very surprised. He was kind enough to give me a book this, yeah, this past idea. year, and I read it. I didn't write, you know, I, I read so many of these things, but every once in a while, I said, okay. I said, this man has a commanding gift of the English language. A lot of us can speak, but we can't write. A lot of us can talk, but we can't sing. But here's a man, here's a man that not only knows his subject, but also knows how to write in a very, very interesting manner. Now, can he sing? Yes, he sings very, he, 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 sings, he sings very well. Now, uh, he will be speaking, and, and incidentally, he has something that's available on the internet, maybe we can post it on the internet, Myths and Realities for the Future of Testosterone Theory. And uh, one in four men over the age of 30 have low testosterone. Uh, as men age, they are likely to experience 
symptoms such as lack of sex drive and erectile dysfunction as a result of low testosterone. The research is explained. Low testosterone, and I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pass that. I'll let that up to him. It can, uh, it, low testosterone can change an awful lot of things. I remember many years ago I went to a doctor and said, you know, my, my, uh, I think my testosterone is low. He, he took, the, sent, took the blood sample, sent it back east to wherever he sent it, and it came back and said, you'll lower the testosterone. Only later, after talking with Dr. Phil Miller, did I find out that, you know, there's, there's hormonally active testosterone, and there's, uh, which uh, most of us do not have. And so I think that basically, Dr. Kerge has been in, he's on, He's been on many television shows, national television shows. He has, uh, he has always been interviewed in USA Today uh, for things of that sort. So I think we're going to hear a man that has a great deal to offer. And I encourage you to take a look at this book. This, the book shocked me as to how good it was. And uh, so Dr. Cruje, if you'd be kind enough to come up here. Thanks. Thanks, Well, after an introduction like that, I don't know what I can do, but what I'd like to do, because my talk was aimed mostly for men, and I noticed that there's almost 50% women here, um, I have written a book for women as well. That's the pink-colored one. And, uh, but did you know that men actually prefer pink, and that pink calms men down, even though women like to wear it? So what I'd like to do before I start, since most of you are very well educated here and know very much more about testosterone than probably my patients do, is let you ask some questions in terms of what it is that you want to know about testosterone, for men or for women, and then I'll target my talk towards you because what I've prepared is directed more mostly for men. So, any questions? Yeah, yes, sir. How, how do we get our significant others to take? Good question. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, young people, they, you don't hear about prostate cancer. And then at a certain age, you, you have you, 40s or 50s, you can develop prostate cancer. Or, <coughs> and then they tell you not to take any testosterone. I'll be talking about that as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, what, what kind of uh, natural substances like uh, food they can take that would naturally increase your testosterone? None. The only thing that increases <laughs> testosterone is lots of sex and exercise. <laughs> and what, what about L R D? No, I'll talk about that. At the VA, I asked them to measure my free testosterone, but they didn't. They just measured your total. the total, which was, turned out to be 440. I don't remember the units. 300 to 1200 is nanograms per deciliter. But my question, one question is, um, the uh, free testosterone is supposed to be about 2%. 1 to 2%. Is that, is that, a, is that a general rule that one yes. can go by? Yes. So, so do, can one infer from the total what the free is <laughs> accurately? No. No. Okay. no, but the free is the important one, and I'll talk about that. Yes, women's questions, more women's questions. <laughs> what causes women to have high testosterone levels, and what can bring it down? High mm -hmm. testosterone? Well, higher than the norm. <laughs> There are certain conditions in women, like polycystic ovary syndrome, which cause an abnormal level of testosterone in women. But generally, women tend to have increased testosterone as they age. Men tend to have lower testosterone as they age. And this is because, if you're not aware, all estrogen comes from testosterone. So testosterone is the precursor for estrogen. Yes, our shirt. Short of uh, you know, doing tests like free testosterone blood tests, what biomarkers are there? You know? I'll mention those too. Yes, ma'am. Yes, does testosterone cause hair loss in women and men? Yes, good question. Um, baldness is approximately 29 to 83% of men. It's an inherited factor. And if the testosterone converts to dihydrotestosterone, which it can also do besides estrogen, that can trigger those baldness genes to increase baldness. But if you don't have the baldness gene, it doesn't matter what your testosterone is, it's not going to cause baldness. 
Does, does the, uh, the testosterone strengthen the uh, heart muscle and what's the mechanism? Yes, testosterone strengthens all muscle. What's the mechanism? The mechanism is something that I will go into, but basically uh, it involves a strengthening of the ligaments and tendons. It has a positive collagen effect, and so any mus muscular tissue responds to testosterone. Testosterone was first discovered in 1935. The doctor who discovered it won the Nobel Prize for it was used for treating angina and heart disease and diabetes. Are you going to talk about aroma, aromatase inhibitors? I am. Uh, the purpose of DHEA, DHEA and 7 keto DHEA, does each of them increase testosterone? I'll talk about DHEA too. And 7 keto. I won't talk about 7 keto, but I'll talk about DHEA. What are the right baseline measurements and ratios of hormones? Okay, I'll talk about that. I'm just wondering now, in, in men, are there certain factors or, or chemicals that make testosterone go to estrogen? Yes. Fat, number one. Okay, so this is not testosterone. Could you discuss a little bit about the salary versus the serotestine? Yes, I will. I will discuss that. And it is about testosterone, actually. No, okay. Progesterone. Oh, for progesterone and all hormones. Yes, sir. Um, is there a, a practical risk of accidental transfer from men to women um, in a relationship with a man who's using transdermal testosterone? Yes, there is. And that's something that the companies deal with by having men wear t-shirts for sex. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have sex with the t-shirts. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, what is Environmental estrogens. I'll talk about environmental estrogens too. Okay, is that it? Good. Now I know what you want to hear. <laughs> so, what really affects aging? Is it hormones? Is it exercise? Is it diet? Is it genetics? Well, it's actually all of the above. What the research shows is that as we age, certain changes take place. And we're familiar with those changes. But most of us don't realize that many of those changes are related to chemicals that change within our body. Hormones are chemicals that are produced by hormone glands and secreted directly into the bloodstream. So that they circulate through the body in a flash. And they work in tiny, tiny, tiny amounts. We're talking one trillionth and one billionth of a gram. These measurements are called nanograms for a billionth, picograms for a trillionth. The reason this is important because many of you have probably heard about environmental pollutants and pesticides, particularly something like dioxin, which is TDDC. Uh, I'll, I'll get the whole name out soon, but it's quite a long, complicated molecule. Dioxin is present everywhere. It's present in the air we breathe, it's present in the food, it's present in the water. The main production of dioxin is from incomplete burning of compounds or the production of plastics, mostly vinyl. Dioxin is toxic and will cause cancer in parts five trillions of a gram. So dioxin works almost at the same level as hormones do. And actually, many of the environmental toxins, dioxin among them, PCBs, PVCs, the entire alphabet soup of co compounds you've been hearing, act like estrogen. One second, please hold that question. And the problem with estrogen is aside from the good things, and I'll talk about the good things briefly, is that estrogen makes cells multiply. Estrogen makes cells multiply quickly. That's so that babies can be formed. The problem is all cells respond to estrogen, particularly sex organ cells. So estrogen is responsible for breast cancer, prostate cancer, uterine cancer, cervical cancer, all the cancers related to the sex organs. And if we're getting estrogen in our food through dioxin and pesticides, most of us 
are over estrogen loaded. Now where does estrogen go? And there was a question here about that. Well, estrogen goes into the fat, just like all toxic substances go into the fat. And the fat has a hormone in it called aromatase, which can convert testosterone to estrogen. So that not only are we getting estrogen from the environment, plastic bottles, you see people drinking plastic bottles, those plastic bottles are releasing compounds called phthalates and other compounds related to phthalates that were supposed to be present in safe amounts, but actually, because I told you five trillions of a gram, these compounds can actually raise cancer risk. So please, don't use plastics, don't microwave with plastics, use glass. There are lots of waters that come in glass bottles. They're perfectly safe. Plastics are not safe. They have now been uh, marked as warning for babies not to use plastic bottles for your babies. Because these compounds, which are present everywhere and are ubiquitous, not only affect us, but can go four generations into the future, affect our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. The genetics are carried through. So, when a regular guy goes to visit a doctor, and the doctor checks his testosterone, most of the time he measures something called total testosterone. Total testosterone is a measure of all the testosterone in the body. And the range for men from ages 20 to 50 is 300, 270, 250, some labs use, to about 1,200 nanograms per deciliter, billionths of a part of a deciliter, a tenth of a liter. When the doctor measures the level and finds that, as one man here said, it's 400, that's completely normal. So, the patient has to accept the decision based on a single measurement that his testosterone is normal and there's nothing wrong with him. As a matter of fact, most doctors recommend Viagra or Cialis as a treatment for problems with erections, which is what brings men into the office in the first place. And 30% of the time, it's related to low testosterone. A single measurement of testosterone is not sufficient to diagnose hypogonadism, according to Adrian Dobbs, world-famous endocrinologist at Harvard. Uh, sorry, Johns Hopkins. For some men, the optimal testosterone level is below average. For others, it's above average. The gray zones blend into normal ranges, and nobody knows what's best for everybody. You may be perfect at a testosterone of 800 nanograms per liter per deciliter. Whereas Michelle sitting in front of you, a level of more than 25 nanograms per deciliter would make her a high testosterone woman. So women and men both have testosterone. And it does exactly the same thing in both sexes. Increases sexual drive, increases sexual desire, increases muscular strength, increases um, lubrication, both in the eye and in the vagina. Um, it acts to increase in strength in heart muscle. It acts to increase in strength in all muscles. How many of you here are over 90? Anybody over 90? Anybody in their 80s? Did you know that a man in his 80s can increase his strength by 800% by lifting weights. 800%. And a man in his 80s should be able to get two erections a week without any problems. Whereas most men, by the time they reach 60, they think it's all over. As a matter of fact, one out of 10 men over the age of 40 has what's called hypogonadism, or low testosterone. <coughs> Yet medical records show that this is rarely used as a diagnosis. In medical school, doctors are taught that correcting hormone deficiencies is important just as treating any other disease. But first of all, a diagnosis has to be made. The interpretation of testosterone levels is so complex 
that the condition is overlooked by most doctors because they just don't want to go into it. A man can still maintain sexual function even though his testosterone levels show that they're below normal. It's only when the circulating or free testosterone level is measured. And as our friend over here mentioned, that's only 1 to 2 percent of the total testosterone. It's actually 1 to 2 percent in women. It's closer to 2 to 4 percent in men. When free testosterone falls below 50 picograms per milliliter, let's put that into nanograms per deciliter so you understand. That's about 5 nanograms per deciliter. Erections cease. There are no more erections possible. So at that point, treatment becomes essential. It's no longer an option. So when does this drop in free testosterone take place? Somewhere around the mid-50s. How many men are over 50? 50% of the men that pick their hand up have low testosterone, below normal for your age. How do you know? I'll tell you that in a minute. So circulating or free testosterone is the hormone that you have to remember. When you go to your doctor and say, I want my testosterone level checked, you have to say, I want my free testosterone level measured, not just my total testosterone. Actually, when a man has problems with sexual function, it's his wife that's more likely to bring it up rather than he. And since this is the role that women are taking with their men, then they should understand what testosterone effects have on their husbands. And for this reason, I wrote my book, A Woman's Guide to Men's Health. So the clinical picture of aging men is very, very similar to the picture of hypogonadism in younger men. Decreased testosterone seems to play a role in most elderly men, but we're not really sure what that role is. Since the most consistent effect of treating men with normal testosterone as they age is a change in body composition and an increase in sex drive. What that means is that any man here, if they were to take testosterone, whether they needed it or not, it would change their body composition more fat mass turns to lean mass, in other words, they get more muscle, and it would increase their sex drive. But that's it. It wouldn't do anything else, and it wouldn't have any of the benefits that, low t that treating low testosterone does in men who are deficient. So since borderline deficiency, we call it androgen deficiency, androgen means male, cannot be easily diagnosed in the elderly, it becomes very difficult for a physician to determine how much is supplemental hormone and how much is pharmacological hormone. In other words, does the man just need a little more testosterone or does he need complete replacement? Patients are often asking me when I put them on testosterone, does this mean that my testosterone is not going to be produced anymore from my testicles? And I answer to them, yes, if we replace your testosterone, your testicles don't need to make it anymore. But the only reason we're replacing it is because they weren't making enough in the first place. So these are some of the complaints I hear from men with low testosterone. Fatigue is the number one complaint. And it's a common complaint in many medical conditions. Yet it consistently accompanies low testosterone. Where some men might not be able to get an erection with completely normal levels of testosterone, Others are still having sex with a strong drive with low or below normal levels. So I have found that the following symptoms are most consistent, and these are not the guideline symptoms which I will give you at the end. Lowered sexual drive as compared to previous interest in sexual partners. Loss of early morning erections from previous levels. Men usually wake up with erections every morning when they're young. They go and urinate. Many of them think it's related to urine. It has nothing to do with that at all. <laughs> Erectile dysfunction, including premature ejaculation with decreased firmness of erections. Central obesity. What does that mean? When you see guys with a pot belly, those are the ones with low testosterone. You have low testosterone. <laughs> so how can you tell? Like, what is extra waist size? Well, there are guidelines. 
If your waist increases more than two inches since you were married, then you probably have some <coughs> abdominal fat. The figure is 35 inches for women, 40 inches for men. Anything above that is considered obese. Affected mood and cognition, including loss of motivation, desire to exercise, or for men, interest in sports. When your husband or boyfriend is no longer interested in watching sports, if he used to be interested, you know something is wrong. Moodiness and anger outbursts with feelings of aggression when frustrated. So it's not high testosterone that causes aggression. It's low testosterone. Irritable male syndrome, I call it in my book, or grumpiness with a total lack of interest in touching or kissing women. Fatigue that peaks in the afternoon and makes men feel like they could fall asleep anywhere, anytime. And loss of muscle tone and weakness manifest by joint aches and pains unrelated to activity. If you go out and exercise and your joints hurt, that's okay. If your joints hurt and you're not doing anything, there's a chance that it could be low testosterone. As a matter of fact, many of you may not be aware, but a condition called juvenile arthritis, which is a deficiency of, well, it's a swelling of the joints, is related to a deficiency of a compound called DHEA, dehydroepiandrosterone, in young boys and girls. But these are common complaints. I'm sure everyone in this room has experienced some of these complaints at some time. Even in midlife, many people complain of loss of motivation, dampens their enthusiasm for hobbies, business ventures, and sexual pleasure. Many men think they're just getting old. There's nothing that can be done to correct the problem, especially if they're losing their erections. They couldn't be more wrong. Just because a doctor tells a patient that his testosterone levels aren't abnormal doesn't mean that he should put up with hormone-induced sexual dysfunction. A man can have good sexual function even though tests reveal low levels of testosterone, but it's only when the circulating or free testosterone levels fall below minimum 50 picograms per milliliter that erections disappear. What else does testosterone do? Well, in men who develop low testosterone, it's often associated with increased waist size, high, H, uh, high LDL cholesterol and low HDL, or good cholesterol, high blood pressure, and abnormal blood sugars. But the role of sex hormones in the cause of these conditions, which is now known as metabolic syndrome, used to be called Syndrome X, the deadly quartet, um, and usually that leads to diabetes and death. Uh, most doctors are not aware that there is an association between low testosterone and something called sex hormone binding globulin, particularly with the development of diabetes. It is now estimated, particularly from the Massachusetts Male Aging Study, uh, that 30% of diabetics have low testosterone. In obese men, Testosterone, free testosterone, and sex hormone binding globulin, which I'll call SHBG, are significantly lower than in non-obese men. Why is that? Well, remember earlier I told you that aromatase in the fat converts testosterone to estrogen. So what do you think would happen with children? If you have an obese boy, do you think that he would reach puberty earlier or later than a non-obese boy. Let's show a hands for earlier. And let's show a hands for later. The laters win. Now what about a girl? If a girl is obese, will she reach puberty earlier or later than the non-obese? How many for earlier? Oh, correct. So, obesity in and of itself is a cause of low testosterone. Somebody asked about DHEA. DHEA and DHEAS, DHEA sulfate, are precursors of many of the hormones. In my book, I call it the mother of all hormones. Progesterone, I call it the grandmother of all hormones. This is because DHEA can convert to androstenedione, which is a direct precursor of testosterone. And DHEA is a hormone secreted from the adrenal glands that acts in the opposite direction to cortisone. 
which most of us have heard of. Does everyone know that cortisone is also the stress hormone? Yes. So, well, you're very well informed. So that <laughs> DHEA balances out the cortisol. So when cortisol is up, DHEA is down. If you take DHEA, it lowers cortisol and tends to raise testosterone, but only in women. It has no effect in men. So DHEA is predictive of menopausal syndrome, depression, in addition to weight gain in women. Anemia is another frequent feature of <coughs> low testosterone. The presence of low testosterone in older persons is a risk factor for anemia. Among non-anemic participants, men and women with low versus normal total and bioavailable testosterone have a significantly higher risk of developing anemia within three years. That means that older men and women with low testosterone have higher risks of anemia. Women also respond positively to testosterone supplementation. Many physicians don't realize that women with sexual dysfunction, estimated 40 million women in this country, uh, may be deficient in testosterone. By the way, do you have any idea how many men have sexual dysfunction in this country? How many think less than the women? Less men than women. It's 40 million women. How many think it's less men? How many think it's more than men? She's right. It's actually 30 million men. And yet only 13 million men are estimated to have low testosterone. True hypogonadism. Levels below 300. The gold standard. Unfortunately, of those 13 million men, less than 1 million men get prescriptions for testosterone. According to Susan Davis, a world famous researcher, a physician in Melbourne, Australia, um, who does a lot of work with women and sex drive, she says, and this is a quote from her study, we report that serum androgen levels, male hormone levels, decline steeply in the early reproductive years, do not vary as a consequence of actual menopause, and that the postmenopausal ovary appears to be an ongoing site of testosterone production. What that means is that women who've had their ovaries removed will eventually develop testosterone deficiency. But as men age and their testicles produce less testosterone, women age and their ovaries produce more. So a woman and man of the same age, the woman has more testosterone than the man. Maybe that's why they like younger men and younger women. So what about prostate cancer? Prostate cancer is a huge myth. And actually, the reason I call this myth and myths and realities for the future of testosterone therapy is that prostate cancer is one of the biggest impediments for physicians to prescribe testosterone. Yet recent reviews have failed to find any compelling evidence to support a causative relationship between testosterone and prostate cancer. The report by the Institute of Medicine, which was a huge report after the Women's Health Initiative where they found that synthetic uh, estrogen and progesterone were dangerous and could produce breast cancer, said, quote, in summary, the influence of testosterone on prostate carcinogenesis, cause of prostate cancer, and other prostate outcomes remains poorly defined. The lack of evidence for what has been assumed for decades to be a solid relationship between testosterone and prostate cancer has been confusing cl clinicians and the public for years. As a student once asked innocently, if testosterone is so bad for prostate cancer, why is it so hard to prove? The underlying logic has always been inconsistent. The disease is almost never seen during the 20s when testosterone peaks. As a matter of fact, teenagers and men in their early 20s never get prostate cancer. It only becomes prevalent when men are older and testosterone levels have declined. If testosterone were really fuel for the fire, then why would the small foci of prostate cancer noted in young men who are uh, from autopsy studies, the soldiers that die, not develop into cancer at early ages. In other words, even men in their 30s may have small areas where prostate cancer is starting, but they never develop it. The answer is that it may take 30 or 40 years for testosterone to stimulate prostate cancer to grow. Then why do we have any hesitation in offering testosterone replacement therapy to men in their 60s and 70s? 
Well, most doctors say, gee, if there's a small risk of prostate cancer, I don't want to give anybody testosterone and have them get prostate cancer. Well, what if the opposite were true? There are no large long-term studies of testosterone replacement therapy. However, the prostate cancer rate in the published trials, and these include the pharmaceutical companies who have brought out testosterone products, the rate is approximately 1%. This is exactly the same as the cancer detection rate in prostate cancer screening trials. Nevertheless, it must also be recognized that the number of men in the study of less than a year was quite small. The original assertion that higher testosterone enhances prostate cancer growth has persisted as a medical myth since 1941, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Longitudinal studies have repeatedly and consistently rejected this hypothesis. And if testosterone is food for a hungry tumor, then why is the cancer rate only 1%? For men receiving testosterone replacement therapy, when one man in seven hypogonadal have biopsy-detectable prostate cancer. So the true nature of this myth is revealed best by its historical origin. It was one equivocal blood test in a single patient that related the testosterone to prostate cancer. Other investigators have failed to find any progression of prostate cancer when given testosterone to men with prostate cancer. And it has been postulated that the near maximum stimulation of prostate cancer occurs at testosterone concentrations found in normal men. So, today, there is not, nor has there ever been, a scientific basis for the contention that a higher testosterone concentration causes prostate cancer growth, acutely or long term. So can we continue to deny testosterone replacement therapy to men who are symptomatic and women who are symptomatic when history teaches us that administration fails to cause any disease progression? As a matter of fact, might there be clues linking low testosterone with prostate cancer. And below normal levels of testosterone are associated with high-grade disease. In other words, men who develop prostate cancer and have low testosterone die from their prostate cancer. Might it even be possible that androgen administration, testosterone administration, could prevent prostate cancer? After 65 years, it's time to discard the myth and to entertain new ideas. New studies have shown that men with a family history of prostate cancer, any men here with a family history, have a 10 time risk of prostate cancer if they have low testosterone. So where's the future of testosterone prescribing? Again, the condition is known as hypogonadism. Low testosterone leads to a bulging waistline, lack of motivation to get things done, Combine that with low energy, the absence of a sex drive, and you have the making of a disaster in marriage. That disaster almost often manifests as a couch potato with irritable male syndrome. The signs of hypogonadism ranging from the obvious to the surprising, yet several patterns have emerged in men who are suffering from this condition. And this is what they are. A decrease in bone density by DEXA scan or a loss in height of more than one inch if a man or woman loses more than one inch in height. And when you go to the doctor and he says, how tall are you? And you say, well, I'm five foot two. Would you measure me, please? Because most of you would be surprised. High blood pressure and enlargement of the heart associated with chest pain. Increase in abdominal girth, more than 40 inches for men, 35 inches for women. Low free testosterone. Occasional low total testosterone and normal or low normal bioavailable testosterone. For those of you who want the website, on the, inter on the internet, this site, www.issam.ch slash free Testo dot htm. If your doctor does a sex hormone binding globulin and a total testosterone, 
you can use that chart and calculate your bioavailable and free testosterone if he doesn't want to do it. So contrary to what men think, hypogonadism is not caused by a defect in their testicles. Instead, it's due to improper functioning of the pituitary gland, that part of the brain that controls testosterone production through a hormone called luteinizing hormone. Or in the hypothalamus, <coughs> that region of the brain that controls the pituitary. Studies have also linked erectile dysfunction and low testosterone, as well as diabetes and low testosterone. And again, it's the free testosterone that determines the amount that is actually functional. A diagnosis is currently confirmed when total testosterone, considered the gold standard, falls below 300 nanograms per deciliter. Unfortunately, using a low T of less than 300 to define hypogonadism results in 36% false positives and 12% false negatives as compared with low free testosterone. These are particularly important um, because low testosterone is a complication of diabetes. The 30% of men that were found in the male aging study to have uh, diabetes and low testosterone, this study involved over 3,000 men, um, none of the subjects tested had been previously diagnosed with low testosterone, yet nearly one-third of the men had low testosterone. So I'm just about finished. I think I covered all the questions. Progesterone. Um, progesterone is a precursor of DHEA and a precursor of testosterone. In women, progesterone, and I discuss this in quite a bit of detail in my book, progesterone is responsible for calming women down, regulating their blood sugar, helping them sleep, helping them regulate their weight, and also opposes the negative effects of estrogen which cause cancer. So in the Women's Health Initiative, the study showed that women using synthetic estrogen and synthetic progesterone had an increased risk of breast cancer, Alzheimer's, and heart disease. What the studies show is that the use of natural progesterone negates all of those risks. Unfortunately, they didn't do that study. Um, the 2006 testosterone prescribing guidelines, and they're also available in my book, and it's too long a, a URL for you, but basically I'll give them to you quickly. These are the symptoms and signs suggestive of low testosterone in men, according to the Endocrine Society. Incomplete sexual development, unicoidism, aspermia, no sperm production. Reduced sexual libido and activity. Decreased spontaneous erections, those are in the morning. Breast discomfort, breast enlargement, gynecomastia as it's called in men, or bitch tits as the bodybuilders call it. Um, loss of body, hair, reduced shaving, particularly axillary and pubic hair. Very small or shrinking testicles, less than five milliliters. Uh, inability to father children, low or zero sperm counts. Height loss, low trauma fracture, low bone mineral density, reduced muscle bulk and strength, and hot flashes and sweats. This is in men. They recommend additional testing, particularly LH and FSH levels to distinguish between primary, testicular, and secondary pituitary or hypothalamic. Additional testing is indicated for patients with symptoms of low testosterone whose test results indicate normal or low normal levels. These conditions include moderate obesity, nephrotic syndrome, kidney damage, hypothyroidism, use of glucocorticoids, progestins, synthetic progesterones, and androgenic steroids or anabolic steroids. Conditions associated with increased SHBG include aging, cirrhosis, hyperthyroidism, use of anticonvulsants, use of estrogen, HIV infection, and particularly in common conditions associated with alterations in SHBG, such as obesity. Okay, that's my talk for this evening. And now, if I didn't get any questions, or if you have any questions, VA gave him estrogen to as a treatment for prostate cancer. Okay, if you're talking about having 
low testosterone could encourage prostate cancer, why were they giving him estrogen? I'll, talk, I'll answer that. What's your second question? Okay, the second question is you talk about plastics. Um, if I remember right, there's three different kinds of estrogens, E1, E2, E3. Which of the three are plastics classified as? Estradiol? Estradiol is the most active estrogen of E1 estrone, E2 estradiol, E3 estriol. The plastics contain compounds, dioxin-related PCB, PVCs, which act like estrogen. They affect the estrogen receptor, the estradiol receptor, which is the active estrogen. In regards to prostate cancer, at one time, because prostate cancer was believed to be feeding on testosterone, men were castrated or chemically castrated by giving them estrogen, which of course lowers a man's testosterone. New studies have just come out this month that indicate that men who are treated with androgen deprivation therapy have an increased risk of metastatic disease with their prostate cancer and premature death. This has been the treatment of choice for all men, and they've all died. Yes, ma'am. If women are taking their suggestion levels, is there a number they should be looking for? If the numbers are in my book. As a matter of fact, at the back of my book, I have all the latest <coughs> age-specific levels for testosterone for women, both free and total, as well as testosterone for men, which is also in my first book, but we didn't have the women's levels at that point. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have two questions. One is on the L-arginine, the increase in nitric acid to give you better erections, and also how much you would take if you recommend taking that. And uh, the DHEA as a supplement, I read where it could cause problems by taking DHEA as a supplement rather than doing things to do support us on. Okay, let me, let me address all of those together. Erections are caused in men, and clitoral erections in women, by the release of a compound called nitric oxide, which is a gas that's released at the blood vessel level. Testosterone is essential for this gas to be released. In other words, if there isn't any testosterone, you're not going to get an erection. For men who do have an erection, the nitric oxide is quickly broken down by what is called PDE5, phosphodiesterase 5. Viagra and Cialis and Levitra were developed to block that enzyme so that <coughs> nitric oxide levels would stay up. Nitric oxide is made by nitric oxide synthetase, which uses L-arginine to make nitric oxide. Without adequate L-arginine, which everybody has pretty much adequate L-arginine until they start aging, it cannot produce nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is important for all blood vessels to expand. So the amount of nitric oxide, as studied by John Cook, who wrote The Cardiovascular Cure. He's a cardiologist from Stanford. You should get him, by the way, for a speaker. Um, found that six grams of L-arginine are necessary for peripheral vascular disease. This is the condition where, after walking a few steps, you start getting pain in your legs because there's not an adequate blood supply. I've actually had an 84-year-old patient that I gave six grams of arginine to, and the feeling came back in his legs, and he can walk now without any pain. And this is what uh, Dr. Cook uh, documents, and actually he probably will win a Nobel Prize for this work. At one time, there was a product called Heart Bars, which had six grams of arginine in them. It's very hard to get six grams of arginine. It's bitter. Most of the products contain 500 milligrams. A mill 500 milligrams is a half of a gram. So you would need 12 of those tablets. But there are products that have more. And if you find something that does have it, then it is helpful. But it's not going to take a man who's not having erections and give him erections. Because they have a problem with the nitric oxide being broken down. Your second question about uh, the DHEA. Uh... Well, I was taking the supplements and it got above the range it should be. And then I read somewhere where it could be dangerous if it's too high, the DHEA, and you get it from taking Well, someone was talking to me earlier about DHEA. DHEA will be taken off the market next year as an over-the-counter product. And the reason is because it's a very powerful hormone. 
Stanford has received a patent for DHEA 200 milligrams as a treatment for lupus erythematosus, one of the only treatments that works. And they use doses of 400 to 1,000 milligrams a day. The normal amount of DHEA sold is 10 milligrams for women and 25 milligrams for men. It seems to help in um, some types of erectile dysfunction, but it has to be taken for a long time. And again, it's working probably by lowering cortisol, the stress hormone. Yes, ma'am. If you have low cortisol, would it be harmful to take DHEA? It's actually never harmful to take DHEA, but I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> DHEA should be prescribed and should be monitored. You can easily have a DHEA level checked. It's very cheap. Many people are deficient in DHEA, particularly highly stressed people. It's a very, very safe supplement, but they're taking it off the uh, over the counter because it needs to be prescribed by a physician. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. What about taking pregnenolone instead of DHEA? Very smart question. Mm -hmm. The sequence. Okay, this is in my book too. But basically, most of you probably don't know that the reason steroid hormones are called steroid is because they come from cholesterol. Sterol. They use the cholesterol sterol molecule. You do not have to eat cholesterol. Your body makes its own <coughs> cholesterol. Without it, you couldn't have hormones. The first step in cholesterol synthesis to hormones is the step to the conversion of pregnanolone. Pregnanolone is a compound you can actually still buy over the counter that seems to be involved in memory, seems to be involved in many, many of the aspects of cognitive function, but the step from cholesterol to pregnanolone is where dioxin and all the environmental estrogens interfere. So right at the very beginning, they block the entire progression of formation of hormones. So pregnanolone would not be any safer than DHEA because it just turns into progesterone, which then turns into DHEA. But for some conditions, it's actually a very effective therapy, and I use it for memory restoration. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things you were mentioning, I have two questions. One is, um, when we were training athletes in the 70s, we actually monitored the testosterone levels in the athletes when the peak. That's when we actually train them. Yeah, it's very interesting. Let me tell you something yeah. about that. When athletes win their uh, event, their testosterone level goes up. Right. But so does the audience on the winning side. Yes. <laughs> and when athletes lose, their testosterone level goes down. And so does the audience on the losing side. So testosterone is influenced by many factors, psychological, physical, but not by foods, except for one thing. Vegetarians have higher testosterone levels than meat eaters. Why do you think that would be? Exactly, because meat now contains so much estrogen in the fat that those bodybuilders who are eating a whole bunch of meat to get their protein, which they don't need to do at all, are actually lowering their testosterone and raising their estrogen level. And vegetarians don't eat animal fats at all. That's what vegetarians are. There are lacto and ovo. Fish is really no different because even though fish has good fats in it, it is still an animal protein, and the fish still concentrate all the dioxin. As a matter of fact, that's how it goes up the chain. The small fish are eaten by the bigger fish, which are eaten by the bigger fish, which are eaten by the polar bears, which are eaten by the Eskimos, which are eaten by the whales. So <laughs> it's very interesting. John Robbins wrote the introduction to my uh, first book. And in that book, he points out that the most highly polluted human population in the entire planet is the Eskimos. They eat no fruits, they eat no vegetables. All they eat is animal fat, blubber. They are at the top of the food chain. They get all the junk that everybody else dumps everywhere. I was in a DHEA study protocol was 90 milligrams a day for three months. And at the end, I was tested for estradiol, free, free uh, testosterone, etc. My estradiol went way up. My free testosterone went way down at the end of this DHH study. And by the way, I ended up with uh, hyperparathyroidism, which I attribute maybe to the estrogen. But however, my question is, 
if I had had an effective uh, aroma case here, would the outcome have been different? It's hard to say for men because most of the studies indicate that DHEA, unless it's used in high doses, really has no effect on men. Hmm. It can't be, it doesn't work yeah, as a precursor. Exception? Probably. <laughs> Probably. I'm sure you're an exception anyway. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you, you didn't address the use of bioidentical versus synthetic hormones when you need to supplement. I didn't because I address it in my book and I talk about Suzanne Summers and I talk about all the things. It really wasn't part of my talk, but let me just say, there is no difference in bioidentical hormones and synthetic hormones when it comes to risk. Same risk of cancer from bioidentical estrogen as synthetic estrogen. Uh, there are less side effects. And bioidentical, which means that it's the same as what the testicles produce or the ovaries produce, are better, but they're not risk-free. So I tell all my women that because they come and they want bioidentical hormones. And we only use bioidentical hormones. But the risks are the same. If you take estrogen as a woman without progesterone, you're increasing your risk of breast cancer three to ten times. And if you take um, a bioidentical testosterone, oh, and that was the other question somebody asked about um, testosterone transdermal. If you take bioidentical testosterone, and by the way, all testosterone products except for injectables are bioidentical testosterone. Androgel, Testin, uh, uh, Striant, um, testosterone on decanoid, which isn't available in this country yet, uh, are all bioidentical. And when testosterone, here's the interesting thing. We have receptors for testosterone in every part of our body, including our skin. So if you take some testosterone powder made from soybeans, it's natural, and you rub it on your skin, you will get testosterone absorbed into your bloodstream. It's not predictable, it's not enough, 10% approximately, but the transdermal preparations, the gels, the patches, they use natural testosterone made from soybeans. And that natural testosterone can be transmitted because it stays on the skin after the alcohol evaporates, all of it isn't absorbed, can be transmitted to your children, your wife, your sexual partner. Uh, if your sexual partner is a male, it's not a problem. If your sexual partner is a female, it may be a problem. The amounts that are transmitted are not very great. However, for children, one of the risks was there was a man who was using androgel and he carried his four-year-old around on his shoulders, and that child developed premature precocious puberty because he absorbed the testosterone. So there is a certain risk, but if you realize that bodybuilders have been using 10 to 1,000 times normal dose of testosterone since the 1960s, and not a single bodybuilder ever developed prostate cancer. But they did develop other problems because they're using injectable um, testosterones. Testosterone is very safe. It is really, really hard to cause any damage. The main side effects from testosterone use are acne, hair loss for those men who have the baldness gene, and um, something called erythrocytosis, where the blood gets thick, like blood doping, due to the erythropoietin that's released by the kidney in response to testosterone. And the other question I just wanted to ask you, you said you got my attention in the beginning, that you said you can make testosterone naturally, Increase testosterone increase naturally. Increase it uh, through sex. Having sex and exercise with weights. So can I ask you a question? Do you write a prescription for... I do. I actually write prescriptions for men. <laughs> <laughs> Daily sex. <laughs> Daily sex with your wife. I want a prescription for my wife. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I once saw uh, a time course curve of hormone, uh, testosterone production in men like from puberty to 18 to all the way to senescence, and it looked like a cyborg hockey stick, and it was straight up and then slow decreasing. Oh, like 21. Yeah. Actually, the best way to get testosterone levels up is in a resistance exercise. Yes. Weight training. Weight training. Right. And the best time for athletes to train is 7 o'clock in the morning because that's when their testosterone level is the highest, and that's where we have the best results with the athletes, and then 10 and 2 o'clock. So this is the ideal range of testosterone. This is 40, 50, 80. Yes, testosterone peaks 
at um, young adulthood. In With that chart, then, what you're saying is over 40, everyone should uh, supplement. Well, again, some men do fine with low testosterone. They have completely normal sexual function. The problem, and this is why uh, Andy Gay did the Massachusetts male aging study, the problem is, is how do you know what's right for you? I have a patient right now, he started with a testosterone of 247, his testosterone is now 310, and his free testosterone was 50, normal range, on our scale is 52 to 280, and now it's 69. And he says, I'm very disappointed that my testosterone only went up a few points. practitioners are good, what practitioners aren't good. We don't take positions on any of that. However, we encourage all of our members to do that, to take positions and to express them because that's how we learn from each other. And of course, when we do take positions, we have to, you know, you have to might say take positions responsibly. I, I get this, uh, I get the Economist. Economist has this interesting slogan. You may have seen it if you take the magazine. Think responsibly. Interesting, interesting thing. So, uh, so tonight we're going to be taking positions. Remember last time I, I mentioned when we started a discussion of zeolite that half the people were for, half were against it, and, uh, and 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 it didn't quite turn out that way because we didn't really have much time to discuss the speaker's presentation. But tonight we, we've decided to have a panel to make up for that, so we're going to do that in the first part of the meeting. But uh, now, before we go any further, make some announcements. Take my Can you read? Okay. In that case, <clears throat> I have to make an announcement, which is which is a very uh, very sad announcement. Um, yesterday, I, I got a call, and uh, I learned that uh, Dr. Bob Cathcart had passed. And uh, you may have probably noticed that he hasn't been here for the last several months. And uh, he was a very marvelous man, brilliant doctor. I won't go through his resume, but uh, those of you who know him know his work with uh, orthopedic, the hip, uh, the invention of the, uh, the hip, the artificial hip, and, and his work with vitamin C and so forth. And uh, so that's, that's uh, something I wanted you to know. And, um, I don't know uh, the memorial service is yet to be announced, unless it came in a late email that I didn't see. Does anybody have any information on that yet? I don't think so. Yes? Do you have any idea what the disease Well, it started with uh, uh, metastatic, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, metastatic prostate cancer. But then it was a tremendous cascade of other, you know, terrible things, and it, it was a tough, it was a tough go. And he's a tough customer, but finally got him. So, um, I, th I think probably the only thing I can think of that's even halfway appropriate is to uh, just have a, a moment of, of silence, if, if you don't mind. We just a moment of silence, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start over again. Next order of business is to open up the forum. We're in the, in the forum section of the meeting, as you probably remember, the whole meeting is a forum, really, because this is a forum. But uh, the part that we that we have before we have our featured speaker, we call the forum. And then that section, people can uh, make reports, short reports, comments, ask questions, get other people's information. It's kind of a group mind here, is what we really are. and. Um, so uh, I'm going to open it up here, whatever you want to talk about. And uh, I read most all of them, and they're all fantastic. Uh, it's, a, it's a medical school education for a layman. Uh, you can't beat it, and it'll tell you what's going on, uh, you know, like we all know. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> OK. 
Can you give a, little, give a little plug here, Phil? Yeah, sure, Jim. Okay. Uh, I was going to remind you, for those of you that are new, we have a wonderful website, uh, www.smartlakeforum.org. And I think this will be my 73rd or 74th video now that I've shot. So we have most of them up in front there. And for those that are missing, well, there's a list of all the videos. You can just give me a call and order one, okay? Great. Thank you so much. And this month, we have a free pre-discussion for those that buy the first ones that's behind the one that's on the, the last one's DVD. Great. Thank you. They're great videos, too, I'll tell you. So, I mean, uh, go way back, like three, four years now. Seven years, well, seventy-two, so it'll be six years. She has a book on uh, acid reflux also, and she talks about antacids, and that ought to get your attention because she rips them apart, and basically they they'll destroy your digestive system if you take them long enough. Right, and, and you know, I, I also have to believe that personally, and, and uh, Jonathan Wright has a good book on that too. Right. Okay. Anybody else? By the way, talking about you know drugs that were sold. Antiacids are over the counter, but they're awful powerful. Some of them are, some of them are by prescription. Those are the worst ones, actually. But uh, one of the handouts that I brought tonight is on Avandia, which is turning out to be a major disaster. And if you look at the worldwide statistics, probably kills almost as many people as Vioxx. So if you know anybody who's taking it, pick up one of those handouts. It came out of Science News, and it's got all the research that you, you know, uh, can follow up on. Check it out for yourself. So, uh, and see anybody else? Who we, who we got here? Just... Is anybody going back down towards uh, Sunnyvale tonight? I could get a ride with on the way after. Okay, thanks. I'm Dick Vaughn. I'm one of the directors on the board of directors. And before I forget, I want to uh, call for a volunteer. Um, our program director and editor, Mike Corrick, I'm going to stand up for a second. I think everybody knows Mike. He does a fantastic job for trying to start my uh, this, this man is, is, is a rock and uh, does so much work for this organization. He would really like to get some help with the newsletter um, in the form of an assistant editor. And the main skill you would need uh, to contribute would just be familiarity with Microsoft Word so that you could help him with the formatting. Do we have a volunteer already? What is, what is your name? My name is Shiva. Shiva? Yes. Okay, Mike, nice lady right here. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have a few opening slides we'd like to show tonight. Um, this is our mission statement uh, that we agreed on when we were working on incorporating Smart Life Forum, becoming a California nonprofit corporation. Our mission is to provide credible health education to the public with an emphasis on optimal wellness, not just wellness, but optimal wellness, anti-aging medicine, and longevity. Um, and the way we go about it is with these two overarching goals, we provide a community forum, this forum, and in the future maybe we will have others for attendees to share uh, information, health-related information, as you have already been doing this evening, and to hear presentations from expert uh, guest speakers in the field of health and wellness, as you will in the second half of this program. And we do our best to keep the public up to date on the latest findings and developments that impact on human health. Um, I would like to remind everyone that we last year we went to a lot of trouble to become incorporated. We're officially a California nonprofit corporation, what's called a 501c3, uh, similar in some ways to uh, KQED and you know, public TV and radio stations. Which means that you can, if you want, you can make charitable contributions to Smart Life Forum, which we hope some of you will. And uh, they are tax deductible. What about the dues? The dues are also tax deductible, less uh, $15, which is the value of the newsletter. So I think most people pay $60 a year in dues. You can deduct 45 of that uh, as a deduction on your personal income tax return. Um, so, you know, we, we're trying to raise funds to do more. Uh, in particular, we want to publicize Smart Life Forum 
to the broader public because our mission is to provide uh, health information to the public. So we want to we want to do more in the way of publicity and recruiting uh, new members, smart members like you. And uh, we would also like to attract additional high quality speakers. And Mike has done a fantastic job getting speakers to come here. And uh, some of them are in the in California or in this area. Some of them come from far away. And uh, it's a job to, uh, to coordinate that. Maybe they're coming in for a conference or a meeting or something, and we get them to swing by here and give us a presentation. And usually, you know, in the past, uh, it's only been occasionally that we've had to offer reimbursement for travel expenses and accommodations. But there are an awful lot of good speakers in this country, and we'd like to reach out further to, to the uh, other parts of the country, all the way to the East Coast, and pull in uh, speakers that we know you would like to hear and we would like to hear. To do that, we um, we need to have a have a budget that we could work with. Uh, lastly, uh, eventually we'd like to. We think we we will grow and we eventually will outgrow this meeting place and we'll need to find a larger and better uh, meeting place. That probably won't happen in 2008, but there's a good chance that it could happen in 2009. So um, I'd like to make an appeal to you all to, you know, please help us to improve, you know, consider making a donation. There are several ways you can do it. Uh, you can stop by the registration table over here and see this lovely lady in the black sweater, Sandy Goble, is our treasurer, and uh, should be very happy to uh, uh, take your donation, give you a, a receipt for it. Um, actually, you don't need a receipt uh, unless the donation is over uh, $250, but we'll be happy to provide one in any case. Um, or you could mail your donation. Uh, the address is shown up here, Smart Life Forum, 855 Fremont Street, Menlo Park. Um, or you can go online. It's www.smartlifeforum.org, and uh, you can actually make a, a charitable donation using PayPal. <coughs> You don't have to have a PayPal card. You can use any credit card, but we uh, process, we'll process it through the PayPal. Um, is the website secure? The PayPal transact the PayPal part of the website is secure. Yes. But if I put my credit card on your website, is that secure? You will. You will. What will happen is you'll go to our website to access PayPal. So you leave our website. You go to PayPal make a secure transaction, and then you'll be returned to our website. Um, this last slide, uh, I, I have an exciting announcement to, to make, actually. We um, have an anonymous donor who, just this week, uh, pledged $1,500 um, as a challenge match, which means uh, for every dollar donated by a Smart Life Forum member, will be matched by a dollar from this matching grant up to up to uh, fifteen hundred dollars and I wanted to show you our uh, summary of our 2008 budget the budget is much more detailed than this but these are kind of the main items you know we we typically run a little over five thousand dollars a year for the last few years and uh, a lot of this expense uh, has to do with this facility rental of this facility and uh, the uh, printing and postage uh, costs uh, to, to mail out the newsletter every month. And there are other expenses, but those are the biggest ones. Uh, we've never really done much in the way of uh, publicity, and uh, we've, this year, we've, and for next year, rather, we've budgeted $1,500 to have a major publicity campaign and membership drive, which we have planned to do at the New Living Expo in San Francisco. Be at the end of April, so we want to rent a booth there and uh, man it with volunteers from this organization. We'll have material to hand out on the banner saying "Smart Life Forum" and other things. And uh, uh, you know, that's a, uh, a tremendous place for us to get visibility. Because they have something like 14 or 15 thousand attendees go to uh, to that expo every year. Um, and uh, we've also budgeted some money for an enhanced speaker program. This is to allow us to reach out to the East Coast and other Great Lakes areas and other places in the country and pull in speakers that we might otherwise not be able to get. Uh, so this money would be used to subsidize at least part uh, of 
of their travel and accommodation expenses. And finally, we want to come up with a nice trifold color brochure. Uh, we found a way that uh, we can actually make a large quantity of them, like 1500 or something, for about $400, which is a pretty good deal. But it would have a lot of information about us and about the kind of programs that we have here, how to, what the membership benefits are, how to contact us, how to become a member, and so on. So that's planned for next year. The contents are already have been mapped out, and now we're at the step of uh, doing the layout of it. So if you add it all up, that's a little over $8,000. Uh, we expect uh, to have about 6000 in income coming in from membership dues. We have... Uh, like 150 members on our list, but not all of them uh, are active members. We probably have somewhere more in the neighborhood of maybe 100 active members who come and pay dues and uh, who are regular participants here. So it's $60 each, that's about 6000 and that's about what we've been bringing in in recent years. So, uh, you know, there's a difference there of about $2,000, $2,200. And uh, the unknown are the tax deductible contributions. So we hope you will contribute. And again, we have a from an anonymous donor a challenge match of fifteen hundred dollars, which is a good good deal. I hope we will be able to make good use of it. Okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Dick has uh, done an amazing lot of work for the Smart Life Forum. He got us incorporated. He's also kind of, you know, pulled things together, and uh, we really, uh, it was Sandy's help. Uh, we really are better organized than we've ever, ever been by probably three or four fold. I don't know how you measure that, but so thanks a lot, Dick. Now let's see. Uh, I wanted one more announcement. Uh, Ira. Two um, significant advances. One I told you about um, previously, namely that um, uh, as we age, uh, the telomeres in each of our cells shorten, and eventually they stop. Generally, the cells in your body can't reproduce more than 50 times. There's an exception. In the case, if you get cancer, the cells can reproduce indefinitely. Uh, the telomeres are maintained by a, something called telomerase. A company called telomerase activation has found a way of getting people to ingest telomerase and regrow their tel telomeres. As I said last time, I believe this is the beginning of reversal of the aging process. This is, I believe, a basic aspect of the aging process. The, I have left literature on the um, table from telomerase activation. Um, uh, I inquired, they charge about $10,000 for all their tests for the first year, and, and uh, then you have to go for several years um, uh, checking in on them, but uh, generally the, it's uh, uh, you can wait a couple more years and until your telomeres get short again. What I <clears throat> suggest is that we get some people who know a lot more about biology than I ever will and, and call these people in and have them give a talk. I have uh, in, uh, contact information and in fact I'm going to get in touch with uh, Dr. Miller for example and suggest that we bring in the, the, the TA people. That's the first thing. The second thing is that, <clears throat> as you know, if you chop off your finger, uh, they can they can uh, uh, not regrow it. However, <laughs> Esquire has uh, just come out with uh, an article which uh, uh, indicates that uh, uh, that uh, they are regrowing various parts of various higher mammals including uh, in one case a man. Again, what I know about this could be put in a thimble. What we need is to get Dr. Miller or somebody uh, knowledgeable to go and look into it. I, I have two or three copies of this article, but you can look at it. Furthermore, uh, 
I have a website, and you can read the article on the website. Ira, could you talk into the microphone, please? Talk into the microphone. Talk into okay. the microphone. Oh, yeah. I, I have the website here. Um, hopefully, you can read it. It says esquire.com slash print dash this slash pig finger slash 1007. It's, not, it's nothing that anybody... What month is that? What month? This is uh, uh, October, the latest one. I'm just simply letting people know, letting people know that I know uh, not exactly nothing about biology, but close to it, and that what is needed is that the club get somebody who really knows what he's doing, contact these people, maybe bring them in for, um, for a talk, or at least get from the people involved uh, published uh, articles uh, indicating where things stand. I'm just letting people know that, there are, that, that this is going on. Reversal of the aging process and regrowing uh, body parts. Uh, or correction. I'm letting people know that there's, uh, there are articles that look to me like that's going on. <laughs> yes, go ahead. I want to uh, share something with you, and I wasn't going to do this today. Uh, I've been in contact with a number of uh, scientists like Aubrey Gray and others who really are doing very advanced studies on aging. You need to get the book called Ending Aging by Aubrey Gray. That's part of it. There's a lot more to telomeres. Actually, they found, the studies now show that telomeres has nothing to do with aging. Matter of fact, Hayflick's conflict of 50 division is completely wrong. There's other things called genetic damage, lysosome effects in the uh, scavenging activity of getting rid of all the <coughs> contaminants that are ATP manufactures from the mitochondria as part of aging, and there's also glycation. So the new so science has been proven that it is, has nothing to do with telomeres, and they're now doing some uh, advanced studies in this, and this well, is What's your reference? Age, uh, Aubrey Gray's book, Ending Aging, I had a chance to uh, uh, talk with them about this uh, new science, and I uh, read the whole book twice now because it's not an easy book to read. Can you say that again more slowly? And Aubrey Gray, G R E Y, who is a neural expert in aging, he called a book called Ending Aging. He just uh, sent it over to me about three weeks ago, and I had a chance to read it. And I have spoken with a number of biotech companies now who have. Uh, completely uh, agreed with Aubrey Gray that aging has nothing to do with Hayflick's uh, 50 division telomeres. It's much more into lysosome factors, a lot more into glycation and other genetic damages that they're now working with. Because I have a friend of yeah. mine who spent a lot of time in telomeres research for the last 25 years. Yeah. So I know. Thank, thanks very much, Brent. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm uh, with Bert all the way on that. I, I think uh, that, uh, get, well, just next, he will get right to you. I think that the telomeres uh, was an interesting hypothesis, but it turned out not to be right. And, uh, and Aubrey, Aubrey Gray is the man now in aging research. And uh, John Ferber has reminded us of that several months ago, but I'm sure probably you, you might not remember. But Aubrey, Aubrey, I think it's D. Gray, isn't it? D. Gray? Yeah. D. E. And then Gray is G. S. G. R. E. Y. Uh, English fellow, and uh, I would get that book. It's uh, he, he, I think he says there's seven processes that uh, are involved in aging, and we already know how to halt, in some cases reverse every one of those seven. So we already know how to defeat aging. That's that's how we embrace thesis. Yes, sir. The concept of pretty wacky theories, though. Like, like one of the seven things is to move the mitochondrial DNA into the nucleus, so that, that's the primary source of aging. I mean, mm -hmm. like rocket science. Yeah. But, you know, well, you know, you know, well, you know, 10 years from now, we'll be able to say about his theories, some, maybe half of them are wrong, just the way the telomeres theory is. And also, like, he's 40 years old, he looks like he's 60. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that hurts, that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Aubrey's main contribution is that he's put forth an idea of how to effectively deal with aging and staying young for people who are currently alive. And that is that every year that passes, 
you have to slow down your aging process by one year. That if you can do that, that you have a chance of living as long as it takes to get to whatever breakthrough is out there. And he, I think, is right in saying that we know how to do that now, to, to take an average person and put them on a life extension program and slow down the aging rate and, and extend their life by a year. We know how to do that now. So if we can continue to do that, then there's a good chance that we'll be able to stay alive. Um, in terms of the mitochondrial gene moving thing, um, that's been going on for millions of years. Mitochondrial genes have been moving into the nucleus for a long, long, long time, and there's no reason why that process can't continue. Steve, would you address the mitochondrial, I mean the, the telomerase issue? I agree. Um, well, let me put it this way. I've known for 20 years that Haflex limit is a, an artifact of the experiments that they did. Um, but in terms of whether telomeres do have some impact or not, I don't know enough about it to provide a definitive opinion. But it is clear that <clears throat> genetic damage generally to nuclear genome is a much, much bigger problem than to the nuclear uh, genome. <clears throat> and so anything that we can do to minimize the aging of mitochondria and to minimize free radical damage to mitochondrial genome um, plays a huge difference. And if we can also figure out ways to take, to cause mitochondria that are dysfunctional to commit suicide and have mitochondria that are actually doing fairly well uh, pop repopulate, um, that will be a big breakthrough as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. The, uh, by the way, uh, uh, I wish we had more time to work on this, but we have to move on. But there's another great book, too, on, on aging and, and how to hold on and, and slow down the aging process long enough for the, the really big breakthroughs to occur. You want to be around still when they come. Uh, that's by Kurzweil, K-U-R-Z-W-E-I-L, uh, the guy that invented the electronic organ, brilliant guy in many fields. He's got a book, I forget, he's got many books, but this one's called what? Anybody remember? Yeah, he's got one that you can get orders any of them. Singularity. Singularity, but there's another one before that, isn't there? Uh, Got Maybe it's Singularity. I, the, uh, I have it, and I've looked at it, and it's very good. Yeah. I can't think I have it at home. But anyway, he, he gives his... Find it at the Singularity Institute website. Okay, okay, that's it, that's it. And it's uh, Kurzweil, K-U-R-T... No, no, K-U-R-Z. Z, right. Z is in zebra, W-E-I-L. Like you see on the, on the organs when, you, when they show the, the public television, they show the guys playing, you know, wailing. That's, uh, like, that's one of his machines. Okay, um... Now, um, we're going to have a panel on uh, zeolite, just briefly. I, we're gonna, we'll probably we'll try to do this by, and stop by five after for our break. And uh, we're, we're going to limit the panelists to four minutes each, which is next, next to nothing. And then we're going to open it up for discussion. And uh, Mike's going to moderate it and crack down on anybody who tries to talk you know, more than a, a few minutes. Because we want to get you guys into it. Yeah, absolutely. Now the panel the panel arose because um, uh, last month we, we ran into an interesting issue. Uh, I I brought in a, a sheet with some questions uh, that I found on a website from a guy uh, by the name of Joseph Campbell I think and I don't know if his first name is Joseph that's the other guy but anyway Campbell and so I thought they were good questions so I brought it in and I put it down over here and when I turned around they were all gone again. It turned out that some of our good people. It, with, uh, with good intentions, thought that it was rude to ask these questions, uh, you know, and, and put the speaker on the spot. And, uh, and so then we had an issue as to whether um, the Smart Life Forum should be a, a forum for science or whether it should be a stage for people to, uh, might say, strut their stuff. So, um, so, now we're, so since we couldn't do the forum last time, we're going to have it this time. And uh, so let's see, Steve Fox, come on down and uh, burnt. And uh, Stan Durst, and um, I, I did a lot of research on it, and, and so it's not, and so I won't need really my four minutes, but I want to just pass out the stuff that I brought. Those of you didn't get it, and uh, here, Mike, you want to take over here? Okay, that's Phil. Yeah, you guys sit Forcing to sit on. <laughs> 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 
Free diets for people to eat toxic foods, or are you saying just to minimize it? Because I think when people say toxin free, they mean as as free as you can get, uh, rather than eat toxins. And I, I disagree. I think we should eat a toxic diet. And there's no organic. No, eating organic is a more toxic diet than eating non-organic. So yeah. eat um, organic. And, and 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 there's an issue too because, uh, for example, let me let me point out um, potatoes. How many people have eaten potato? <laughs> Potatoes contain solanine, yes. which is a poison. Okay, if you're one of about 30% of Americans and you eat a potato, it could give you joint pain. You could have arthritis solely from the chemical reaction of that solanine. <coughs> um, that somebody bred a super potato that had so much solanine in it that it actually killed a human being. So that's an example of solanine level that's low enough that you can eat it and it may help you in some level if you don't have this genetic weakness versus a level that's so high that it's as dangerous as man-made pesticides even though it's totally natural rotenone this highly toxic mitochondrial poison 100 percent natural when i wrote the article there's a, a couple of articles over here that i handed out for the library if you want to you know read it you're welcome to about you know plant chemicals what I didn't know at the time, that I've since learned, is that there have been s systematic surveys of man-made chemicals and natural chemicals. And the, the percentage of carcinogenicity is 50% in the man-made chemicals, and it's 50% in the natural chemicals. By the way, Steve works for uh, McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> so on the, on the subject of zeolite, uh, I was first introduced to zeolite uh, in March of this year. And I was introduced by Dr. Noah and by Dr. Lynn. Uh, who spoke last month. I knew nothing about zeolite prior to that. Um, I was turned on and turned off by the product because I was turned on because of the both doctors talking about what they can do for the body. I was turned off because there were a lot of people who were selling it that were in like multi-level marketing, so that turned me off on the thing. So I let it go for many months and um, it was over the summertime uh, Dr. Lin was doing a uh, conference down in, in uh, Hawaii, and I said, well, you know, we have a place on Kona, if you'd like to stay and stay a few days. Well, we were able to coordinate, and we stayed, Mary and I and her friend Steve, and all four of us, we stayed for the, uh, several days uh, um, in Kona. And during those several days, she gave me an, in you got just a little bit of what in the lecture last uh, month, she gave me an in-depth study of why she was doing what she was doing, showed all her scientific studies, all the references that she had. And so in every day, I would quiz her more. I was looking for inconsistencies, inconsistencies. And I was thinking, you know, here's a woman who has uh, had a nice practice up in Seattle, who actually gave up her practice to, because it wasn't working the way she was trained. And same with Dr. Noah, the same thing with him. He had a huge practice up in Seattle, $20 million a year business. He, got, he stepped out of bounds and actually ended up in jail. If you uh, if Google him, you'll find out he spent 36 months in prison because he was doing things differently. He stepped out of the box. Both of them stepping out of the box caused these things. So the zeolite, I didn't know much about. So I do you know, this research. I went online and... I found out that other doctors, and these are doing it. Gabriel Cousins uses zeolite. Uh, then the other week, uh, a couple days ago, uh, Dr. Gary Gordon uh, started uh, promoting zeolite for removing of heavy metals. Now, for those of you who know Dr. Gary Gordon, he was the father of chelation. He's the one who's you know IV drip and stuff like that. So, so he started using them. Maybe it's for marketing, maybe it's a lot. I, we don't really know. I mean, but I noticed that a lot more people are doing it. So the proof to, to me 
uh, and to my wife Mary was that, okay, Dr. Lynn did a protocol. She says, do the protocol, follow what you're supposed to do, and then do a urine analysis. So we, we did the protocol. We did, you know, you urinate for 16 hours, collect your urine, send the samples in, and come back with the test. Well, you know, we come back, just pretty much what she said, you know, the toxicity is not only in the foods, it's in the air, it's all around. And that was a good part of the lecture, was the fact you breathe it, you live it, even if you, you know, the, the whole world, we're all connected, and you know, some countries, like she mentioned in the lecture, like China, is the biggest polluter in, in the world right now. We're inhaling it. We know this is coming on our set. So we always have to find some kind of a media to detox, whether it's zeolite, where you're taking a sauna, where you're doing something, or taking a vitamin C, something has to happen. Well, I did this test, and then I got a call from Dr. Lynn. She said, holy macro, your mercury is off the scale. Well, you know, I removed the mercury from my mouth uh, probably 10 years ago, saying the same as Mary. Uh, and the same with Mary. You know, the reference rate for mercury was like 2.19, which was in uh, micrograms per gram of creatinine, creatinine, is it? Yeah. Creatinine. And uh, Mary was two and a half times the amount of mercury in her body. Now, what I, what I do know is the following things is that what excretes is not an indication about what you have. I mean, you can be excreting mercury one time, and the next time, you know, all of a sudden, lead comes out, or maybe uh, cadmium. So this is a very fascinating. It's my first test. We'll do another one. <coughs> then I started doing research on the internet, and I found out well, they were using zeolite uh, in Chernobyl, when that reactor. They were using zeolite there to pull out the cesium, the radioactive cesium, with good results. And then I found out if you go further in there, you look at the water supplies in a lot of these countries. They were using zeolite, and I don't know what kind, this is like hundreds and hundreds, I guess, different types of zeolite, but they were using zeolite to pull the heavy metals, the pollution out of the water. So there's something to the substance of it, and like Steve said, maybe the way she explained it is not exactly right, but all I know is that she's done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these tests using a zeolite product to remove the heavy metals out of the body and when you have lots of heavy metals, you're causing oxidative damage to the body. And one of the things that she said to me, uh, many things she said, is that when you have so much heavy metals inside your body, your, these heavy metals like mercury will compete, and Steve can verify this, will compete on the receptive sites. And so if you, you're trying to ingest magnesium, because you know magnesium has several hundred enzymatic functions inside the body, that, it, that is competing with the mercury. And guess who always wins? So mercury will always win. So then going back to the book of Sherry Rogers, uh, the MD I talked about, about the high blood pressure of Oaks, is that she wrote another a book called Detox of Diet. When she covers that in the, in the uh, high blood pressure book too. So you always have to clean your body. And I don't know what instruments you want to use to do that, or how you want to do it, or how you want to see whether you want to use sauna, or you want to use zeolite, or IV. But all we know is that as we go through time, we're uh, subjecting our body to all kinds of free radical uh, damage, which causes the aging process. So that's my initial introduction and my little story about zeolite. Well, I got started in zeolite actually uh, way before that, in 20 years ago, I was working with uh, another compound called diatomaceous earth. And the reason I got into that was a friend of mine, Galen Knight, who worked at the uh, MD, MD Anderson School of Medicine at Houston, Texas. He was a young PhD who was heading up a new field of uh, cancer research. And he himself actually, um, started noticing some changes in his skin and had a uh, form of a melanoma that was growing. And he um, discovered through his expertise and knowledge and looking at uh, heavy metals and chemicals, what was activating it, he found that it was nickel poisoning from a wristwatch that he had that was plated with nickel. And he had it um, evaluated and it was a high level of nickel coming out. As you know, nickel is also damaging, so is cadmium and other sources like that. 
and he looked into the Journal of Medicine and found nothing that can remove nickel until he started looking into the veterinarian uh, articles and he found that in veterinarian in Canada they were using diatomaceous earth to remove nickel from uh, um, animals that were heavily poisoned with um, uh, cadmium and nickel and so he told me the story uh, about his own uh, situation and so I started using diatomaceous earth in my clinic way back in the late 80s early 90s and um, you know I can't say I've seen exciting story but I can only tell you that I saw a lot of um, golf um, you know syndrome cases coming in at that time um, UCLA promoted uh, asked me to look at a lot of them because we were doing detoxification programs with um, uh, the Ron Hubbard group and we used niacin and amino acids arginine and saunas and we have phenomenal results in moving heavy metals out of that so I started uh, using diatomaceous with some very good results in there I wouldn't say it was better results than already we had with Ron Hubbard's uh, program that was developed actually by a guy named Lauren Zanier who is a friend uh, of mine but what happened was I am a good friend of uh, a fellow named Merzel of Kulik. And Merzel of Kulik was the original person behind zeolite. He was the actual uh, scientific uh, individual that did all the research on zeolite and humans. And um, all the articles ever written up on zeolite were uh, published by his group. And so it showed that uh, zeolite has very similar uh, uh, principles as diatomaceous earth. I asked chemists to look into it and they said it's even more potent than uh, diatomaceous earth. But they were using zeolite mainly in agricultural and water detox detoxification and in Chernobyl they used it for removing uranium. That was the main thing they used zeolite was to remove uranium from the ground and that's where they're having a lot of problems. So I got involved, they, a group called me up and asked me if I would be part of this group and it, as you know it's a multi-level company, Wyora. And I was involved as a uh, member, board member and advisor to the group and then when I started seeing what they were trying to, uh, what they were putting out as cancer cure, I got out of there as quickly as I could because uh, I don't think it's totally a cancer cure. I think it has some uh, value. I started researching it more. I talked to Dr. Robert Bowman, who is probably a world authority in zeolite at the University of New Mexico. And his concept of human in, uh, utilization of zeolite is unknown to him. He says, I've never seen any research on this. And I sent him Dr. Merzel of Kulik's uh, paper on zeolite, and he was very impressed, but still wasn't enough evidence that zeolite really does what it does internally. I found a source mainly for to give it out to individuals because I did discover in veterinary news that zeolite was effective in helping to accelerate the healing of cows and horses. And I mainly use zeolite and diatomaceous earth for parasites and bacteria and it works very well. But here's how it works. I'll share with you with Dr. Colin. Okay, one minute, okay. Um, is that zeolite taken internally only act, it works in the colon area, in the epithelial tissue of the colon. And it works in two ways. In short levels, in small levels, it works as an antioxidant. And in high levels of high, meaning high use of it, works as an inflammatory thing. It actually initiates inflama inflammation. So you have to be careful with zeolite in both levels. There's another story I can share with you of a personal friend of mine, a PhD, well-renowned, published many articles. His wife had terminal cancer, uh, lung cancer, and, and he, um, we introduced the zeolite to him. And within one month after being in a uh, hospice, uh, found that the zeolite actually was working, the powder one, was working very well in her recovery from complete recovery in cancer, from lung cancer. But there are many forms of zeolite and according to Robert Bowman, the only one I use is a not, it has the least amount of contaminants that all the other zeolites have. So. Okay. When I heard the talk last week, I was very impressed. And, uh, and this woman has wonderful energy and she's a political activist and, and so am I. And, 
you know, wants to change the world, so do I. So I was very impressed. And I was also impressed by the challenge tests that she talked about. And I asked her um, where I could get a hold of some of those, take a look at those. And she said they're on a website. And uh, alas, they weren't anywhere. They're not anywhere. They're not on a website. They're not on any y Yora uh, websites. So I, I started to do some research. I spent about three or four hours on this. And the bottom line is, there is no research whatsoever that shows that zeolite removes mercury or heavy metals from the human body. The, uh, this, this uh, just uh, yesterday came upon uh, Virginia Hopkins' uh, newsletter. Remember, she took over from John Lee, who was a speaker many times. And she, I, I attached her one page uh, answer to a question that she received on zeolite and came to the same conclusion. There's no research. Now, what are these gentlemen talking about then? Well, first of all, zeolite is used to clean sewer water and uh, other kinds of toxic waters, and it is used in Chernobyl to clean the water. Well, it didn't get it; the, the, it didn't get any uh, radioactive material out of sesame or whatever out of human beings. It got it out of the water. At the same time, the, the most prevalent use for zeolite is as a water softener. And what does water softener do? It takes out the magnesium and calcium, two nutrients, which we were told. Zeolite doesn't touch because zeolite being the miracle substance that it's reputed to be, is supposed to only take out the bad stuff and leave all the good stuff. Well, Steve has already said uh, that the mechanism whereby that was supposed to happen doesn't make sense. And I can tell you that the, uh, what we know about zeolite is that it takes out all the, all the minerals, and including the nutritious ones. And it doesn't, and there, but here's the, here's the basic point. There is no research and if you look at Yora, which is a multi-million dollar company, very successful at what they do, very good at what they do, which is market and sell zeolite, they keep saying that there's going to be research, that they've got this group in North Carolina working on it, and next, early next year it's going to come, they'll have the research to publish. Well, it turns out that they said that in 205, and it's still nowhere to be found. There is no evidence that this works. Now, the other interesting thing that I found out that, so, so all these people, including Gary Gordon, you go to their website, you're not going to find any research. The veterinarian stuff, I haven't seen, but I mean, I would like to see it. The, uh, uh, there's also another good reason, by the way, to kind of imagine that it would be difficult for zeolite to remove mercury from the human body, because unless zeolite, mercury is usually stored in fat cells. So in order to, to remove it from a fat cell, you have to get inside the fat cell. And there's no receptors on a, on a cell membrane for zeolite. And so Steve said to me in a conversation of something that I'd already thought of, but when I heard from him, then I know I'm on the right track. He said, you know, how, how, does, it get in, how does it get in the cell in order to get the mercury out? It, it kind of works by contact in a way. I mean, it, it, has, it works by electrical charge and so forth, but you get, it's got, there's a proximity element. So it's, it's doubtful that it could even work. Uh, however, just because we don't know how it works, it might still work. But the fact is, there's no evidence. Now, the other thing that I wanted to call your attention is that um, the, uh, when I, the first thing I found out about zeolite that really surprised me is that there, as I put in my sheet here, there's uh, 48 kinds of natural zeolite and 150 synthetic kinds. One of them is, is asbestos. So, you know, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of zeolite. You certainly wouldn't want to put asbestos in your body, even though it's natural. And of course, I hope you all know by now that, as Steve has pointed out, natural doesn't mean it's safe or good for you. I mean, hemlock killed Socrates, right? It's a natural plant. Snake venom is natural. Uh, asbestos is natural. Just because something is natural doesn't mean it's safe and good for you. Now, uh, how am I doing? I get, I get to maybe th no, one more minute, okay. Um, so anyway, I printed out the, uh, the results of my uh, investigation. And, and the, the thing that I think is striking is that uh, nowhere do you find these, these challenge tests and, and uh, unless you have them. You know, here, here's the challenge test uh, controlled by Wyora. I mean, not only is, is uh, burnt, uh, was burnt active in Wyora, but so is, it turns out, Lynn Henshaw, as I explained in my little document here. Uh, she was, she was you know, at a convention and I'm probably a featured speaker. And so she, you know, it's, it's a very interesting question what exactly her relationship is. We're told that she had no financial ties, but does, does that just mean no ownership? Or does it, does it mean that they promote her website, that they have her as a speaker? I mean, there's all kinds of ways in, you know, in industry that you can do things like that. So it's all up in the air as far as I'm concerned. But the striking thing is that after she gave the talk, people came charging down and bought 
Burns product, which is not the one, the zeolite she's talking about. So they have no idea what they bought, and neither do I. I wanted to point out that Bill and I met with uh, Stan Field last month. Now, Stan Field had a personal report on that, and on Wyoria in particular. He had gone to Dr. Randy Baker in Santa Cruz, that a lot of people know about, and Catherine Gross, our former founder of this organization, has strongly recommended. And he had a reading of 12, uh, which is double what you had, uh, before he started the Wyoria. And when he was through, he was down to three, which was normal on that scale. And the only other uh, odd thing that the doctor, Randy Baker, gave him was a homeopathic medicine. Now, if people don't believe in the homeopathic, it's a Wyoria that did it. People believe that homeopathic is that or the combination. But anyway, in a matter of, I think, six to eight months, he went down from a double your reading to the normal reading using the Wyoria product plus the homeopathic product. Now, I also might report that I had a reading, wasn't as bad as his, of six. And I was using Burns product and something else, and mine went down to three. So, <laughs> so much for, you know, lack of evidence. And of course, it's anecdotal, but if it works, yeah. um, I'd like to point out that um, publishing evidence is not the definitive um, standard to judge evidence by, because there's a disincentive that's provided um, in the system um, if you publish evidence, then that evidence is taken as sales literature, and then your product becomes a drug, and therefore many companies will not be able to tell you what it is that they know about. Now, that may not apply to doctors, but um, that's why I consider the evidence that Dr. Lin presented to be valid evidence. It shows that the mercury is being removed, that heavy metals are, in fact, coming out of the body by the use of her product. And um, I you know, would like to say that I consider mercury toxicity to be one of the biggest unresolved problems in terms of human toxicity, human risk. And that the pro one of the big problems is, is that the two most sensitive organs in the human body to mercury are the brain, which is number one, which is why pregnant women should not ever do anything with mercury. Take it out or put it in, and why it's banned in a whole bunch of countries um, because of the developing fetal brain. But more importantly, the second issue is that the kidney is the second most toxic uh, mercury sensitive organ. And the standard chelation therapy run all the mercury out through your body through the kidney. And so this is a potential risk. Now, the advantage of zeolite, theoretically, is that it's got a, a cell structure. It's got pores in it. And so the mercury that theoretically is inside the matrix isn't necessarily available to cause to kidney toxicity. And what she reported was this doesn't apply to Burns, um, you know, zeolite, but her zeolite, uh, it was 60% of it was absorbed, which means that 40% of it stays in the fecal matter. And fecal excretion is unlimited. So if there's mercury going out in the feces, this is by far the best way to get rid of mercury, if it can be done. Yeah, I think that's it. And, uh, should we ask for some questions? Uh, Epi. Oh, uh, one thing about research. Chelation therapies have uh, never been researched legally. Yeah, there, there, there is no is program that has proven that uh, chelation therapy works. But it's been used for how long, and it works. And number two, zeolite's sort of acting like a chelating agent. So when you chelate, you put the good minerals back in, so you protect yourself. So even if it pulls out magnesium and all the other good minerals, you replace it with good minerals. You can. I lived in the San Fernando Valley area back in the 1950s when zeolite was really being hyped as a water softener. And salesmen would go around from, from, from house to house selling zeolite in, in big 50 pound packages. Well, the, the, the word that came out about what was wrong with zeolite at that time was that it left sodium chloride in the water. So that the, the problem with it was not that it took out 
calcium or magnesium, but that it left the sodium chloride, which was harmful. Now, I don't know if, if, if that was true or was it, it was presented by the competition. But in any case, that was the thing that they were talking about in the 50s, was the danger of, of drinking a lot of sodium chloride. Which is so much. It doesn't do that at all. According to uh, one of the experts in the field of drinking, uh, he's right here in San Francisco, and I can have him come over. He's 45 years in the zeal like business, and he only sells it for agriculture and water. Nothing else. Any, uh, if you load the zeolite up with sodium and chloride, it will emit it. If yeah. you don't, it's not present in the matrix. Right. There is trace amounts of all kinds of things in zeolite. I mean, other than the aluminum and oxide and silica and structures of the cage itself, there, when it formed in the ground, there, were, there was mercury and tin and lead and all kinds of stuff in there, which there's small amounts of that in the zeolite, like there is with uh, all, you know, any of the clay. You know compounds, um, so you know that's the issue that I think does need to be addressed as a quality control issue by the companies that are marketing it. Is where are they getting it? What's in it that they don't necessarily want to be in there? How do they clean it up? How do they process it? How do they make it consistent? And I think Dr. Lin did address that question. Well, I'd like to say that I've used zeolites for other purposes for at least 45 years and that in any reasonable uh, use of zeolite, you would know what the pore size is, you would know what the chemical content is, and for something that you're putting in your body, you would do some flame emission spectroscopy so that you know you're not putting mercury in, which then comes out in the test the next day. <laughs> so a lot of this stuff sounds like snake oil. It may or may not work. You may or may not poison yourself with somebody else's zeolite, it's a question of quality control and knowing what the devil the structure is, because if the pore size is wrong, stuff isn't going to work. Um, I was I say something on that. That's a really good point, because I was curious about uh, that statement that you made, um, because one of the statements was made last month is that how do you know that inside the product is not these contaminants inside there? And we only did one test, and it wasn't done uh, was done with uh, this guy Dave, I don't know where Dave was, Texas or something like that. So he took, he sent the uh, Wyora and another product, uh, Orion, I think it's called, zeolite, and he sent it to a laboratory and to do an analysis of what was inside there. There weren't any heavy metals in there. There wasn't anything, any contaminants in it, uh, or else, you know, it would be really tragic for a company to, to do something, but then we know that sometimes companies do stupid things. But, but um, Wyora is, uh, has a patent on their, on their Wyora. I, I don't understand the patent, but if you look it up, you can uh, type in Wyora, uh, type in zeolite, you go on the internet, and I think I have the number, the patent number in here, and I looked it up, and then it says, yeah, the Wyora has a patent on it. So the, the thing is, is that in that one test, right, one sample, there was no contaminants inside the product, so that, that's what gives me a little bit more, you know, better feeling that what's coming out of this test is from me and not from ingesting some kind of contaminant on the inside. Well, I think we've got to take the 10 minute break now. And Only 10 minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. Okay, good. Uh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.